You know what I love about our business, guys, is you can always expect the unexpected. You know, what everyone thinks is going to happen just doesn't tend to happen. And I think this last month was a great example of that. We talked about this a bit last week, but man, the emerging markets all of a sudden took off. Uh, we've had commodity prices move up all of a sudden. We've had the 10-year treasury move up all of a sudden. And that's all speaking towards some kind of inflation in the future. But meanwhile, the Fed's cutting interest rates because they think inflation's coming down. So it's kind of like the narratives just change so quickly. And what really blows my mind is investors tend to never have their, their money in the right place at the right time. It's like that Dr. John song, I was in the right place, but it must have been the wrong time. Yeah, I know. I think it's, it's, it's always fascinating. It's like, um, it's like a financial advisor saying, hey, I put you in all really great investments. They just didn't go up. <laughs> um, you know, it's a, that was Bob's first 20 years in the business, Chris. Yeah. It's, 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 it's like a basketball coach, right? Yeah. Yeah. I put all the great players in, called the plays properly, but somehow we didn't win, but that's, it's an auction. That's the beauty of markets, right? It's an auction, an auction. You have to have somebody who's, you know, willing to buy and somebody's willing to sell and they both think they're right. And there's millions of those decisions being made at every second of the day. Yeah, there is. And it's just like, you never know when that next change is going to happen. And, you know, one thing we've learned in our career is when the move in something happens, it happens big, it happens quick. Your money already has to be there. And that's why we always talk about diversification. It's kind of like overused, but like, you know, having your money in commodities, having a global portfolio it doesn't pay off for a long time. And then one day it just does all of a sudden out of the blue. And I think that's where investors make a big mistake is like you saw this, right? The last couple of weeks, money's been pouring into large cap growth stocks, which have done nothing. Meanwhile, all these other areas of the market are moving and nobody has their money. Yeah. But I mean, it's really no surprise that that's happening. I mean, it's kind of like this gets repeated time and time again. And, you know, I, I talk to my clients and it's just always the same thing. It's like, oh, we got to get an NVIDIA. You know, we got to be invested in Tesla or whatever that what the hot stock of the day is, nobody's ever excited about getting into commodities or emerging markets. Yeah, yeah. I know. It's like when you, when you think of like enter, enterprise partners, right? And a, a, as a pipeline, pipeline index is up 32% this year. Nobody's talking about that at cocktail parties. They're talking about, <laughs> you know, uh, Apple or Amazon or Google. Um, I don't know. Does anybody go to cocktail parties anymore? Well, if you did, I would definitely talk about energy pipelines because I'd be the most interesting man in the room. Yeah. So- you know, forget NVIDIA. <laughs> Let's talk about uh, energy infrastructure. Um, and that's, you know, that's, that's another great example of an investment did nothing for like a decade. And then one day it went straight, straight up. And I think that's what people don't realize is big moves in the market. And you see the statistics on this all the time. Most of your return on the market comes from just a couple days. And if you're not in for those couple days, you miss all the return. You could miss decades worth of return if you miss a couple days. And I think that's what you're seeing right now in the emerging markets, which we talked about a lot last week, is all of a sudden China moves up 30% in two weeks. Boom, that moves over. You never get that back. And that's why it's just so critical to, to reallocate your money often and spread it out because things are going to happen. Things are going to change. You got to account for it ahead of time. You know, Ryan, I'm a little surprised that you're, you're using that argument about, you know, if you miss the best days in the market, you underperform. You haven't been around long enough to hear the counter argument. Well, what if you miss the 10 worst days, right? Then you have a better return. Like it's almost as if, well, you know, you can pick the 10 best days and you can pick the 10 worst days. I mean, it's just, I love those arguments. Yeah. And I have a wall in China I want to sell you, right? It's just, too, it's too hard to do that. And I think this just proves it because the economic data comes after the market move. Markets move ahead of the data. And that's what a lot of people don't realize. I always hear this, you know, I don't see anything good going on right now in that market, so I don't want to invest in it. Well, that's the best time to invest in it because usually the market's going to move ahead of any good news. When the news is really bad and everyone's telling you it's a bad place to be, you're probably at the bottom, ironically. This is why I love analysts, right? That, you know, you're, you're not allowed to have inside information, but somehow they're going to tell you, you know, what the CEO and the company's doing, where it's, you know, it's not public information. Like Tesla, when Tesla became public, um, every analyst on the street had a sell on it. Right until after it went up like ten thousand percent, and then they started to put a buy on it. Um, yeah, you know, it's, it's like they they're never they're never ahead of the of the company. The company knows more, right? The stock price knows more than the analyst. Well, you know, maybe they should call it that line from Endless Summer: "You should have been here yesterday investing." <laughs> That's pretty much it, Chris. Well, I love that, right? It's like if these analysts are so smart and they completely understand the market trend in any specific industry, why aren't they the CEO of the company? <laughs> Exactly. You know, why, why are they on the sidelines, you know, talking about the trends? Because the reality of it is 
people that are not in the industry, that aren't running a business, they don't know the trends. And that's why analysts are, well, I'll say it, are pretty useless, <laughs> frankly. Well, you know, they're well, not like, I, don't, I don't know about that, Rye. I mean, you know, with, uh, with commodity prices going up here and interest rates going down and the economy heating up, you know, inflation could come back and we could get that recession they've been talking about. They might finally be right. <laughs> you never know. But you look at all these analysts, a the majority of them have a buy opinion on the company, no matter what the price is, right? Whether it's, uh, you know, Deers at 70 bucks, like it was 20 years ago, or 450 bucks, they still have the same opinions. Like, what does it really matter? And then they put these price targets on, on a stock. Um, and you know, when they move the price target, when the price exceeds the price target that they put on it, you know, it's like, oh, no, I meant it should have been 200, not 100. Well, I've got two pet peeves on that. Well, first off, there's buy, hold, sell. Like either you're buying or selling. Yeah. <laughs> What's this old BS? And I love when they say they're constructive on the price. Yes. It means I'm not brave enough to say that I want to buy this, but in case it goes up, I can say I was constructive on it. If it goes down, I said, well, I didn't say buy. I was constructive. What the hell does that mean? Yeah. <laughs> what does the hell does it mean to be constructive on the price? And every firm, every firm on the street has a as a, a strategist who sets asset allocation. Now, now, so we were talking about that. You know, we we're talking about that later today about how do you set asset allocation, not rule of thumb. So, what if your strategist says, you know, the portfolio should be sixty five thirty five, and you have your client fifty five forty five, and the market goes up? <laughs> Can they sue the company? I mean. I mean, what's the whole purpose of having these people? Yeah, it's an exercise in futility, right? It, it just, it makes no sense. But I think you know, what we learned in our career is that everything works over time. It works at different times and you have to have money there before it's a good idea. <laughs> because once it's a good idea, it's probably not a great opportunity anymore. And, you know, right now, I think you have the dynamics changing, right? When we've seen oil prices go up a lot, we've seen the 10-year treasury go over 4%. And you know what that's kind of sussing out is we probably have more inflation coming down the pipeline, no matter what the Fed tells you. And that probably means you want to reposition your portfolio. The portfolio of the last 10 years is probably not the portfolio that's going to work the next 10 years. No, I have to agree with that, Rye. But there's, you know, there's always that wall of worry. And there's a lot of a lot of current bricks in that wall of worry, right? Because you're seeing suddenly China trying to come back and that could impact in inflation through commodity prices. You're seeing geopolitics uh, really heating up in the Middle East. You don't know what's going to happen there. I mean, it's just uh, it's one surprise after another, but that could impact, you know, the price of energy, which impacts the price of everything. So, you know, there is, there's this, always this risk, but, you know, one of the things I think people really don't discount enough is that once that risk is realized, it's already priced in and the market moves on. You know, it's um, and they spend more time worrying about it and adjusting your portfolio, worrying about maybe something bad might happen. <laughs> well, right. And if you always have your portfolio hedged, meaning you always have different types of investments in your portfolio. So no matter what situation happens, you've got it covered. It makes it much easier to be an investor, right? And right now, more than ever, it's like every portfolio review, and we review a lot of them every month, nobody's hedged for inflation. Nobody has a global portfolio because the dollar is weakening and you need to hedge against that. And global assets are a great hedge against that. Even though Chris told me Bitcoin is the best hedge, but I don't believe them. Um, and, you know, it's, so it's remarkable right now how underinvested the average investor is in terms of diversification over different scenarios happening. Yeah, and, and on that note, Roy, I think the greatest fun fact that you, know, you could present to anybody today is the lost decade. When you tell somebody the S&P 500 had a 10-year period with a 0% return, a negative return, they don't believe you. You have to actually pull out charts and graphs to prove it. And it, was, it wasn't that long ago. Well, well, that, Dad, that's, uh, that's a nonsense argument. You're, you're talking about 10 years ago. That was a long time ago. Look at the last three years. Well, the other thing too is people say, oh, you know, I'm a long-term investor. Anyone who doesn't make over money over 10 years, they're not in that investment anymore. No one wow. has that kind of patience. The market doesn't do something for like a year and a half. People get antsy. 10 years, you think you could sit on an investment, make no money like the S&P 500 did uh, a decade ago. It's not humanly possible. I've never seen anyone do it. Yeah, but the best thing about that is that during the lost decade, if you were fully diversified, right? If you owned emerging market stocks, you own REITs, you own value stocks, you own bonds, you actually had a 6 7% annualized return. So it's not like you have to be lost in the lost decade, you know, because you got to be like the sheep and follow everybody over the cliff. Look, the world is changing. The dynamics are changing in a big way. You've got to reassess your portfolio now. Don't look at the trailing 10-year track record because 
whatever did the best probably won't be the winners of the next couple of years. Time to reassess your portfolio, get better diversified. Inflation's probably coming. You heard it here first. Get prepared today. Hey, hope you're enjoying the most recent episode of Pain Points of Wealth. Everything you hear on this podcast, along with some due diligence of your own, can help you get ahead financially, literally at any stage of your journey. But if you want a more hands-on approach and you saved over a million dollars, Bob, Chris, and I will put together for you our total financial master plan, and we'll do that with no obligation or cost. It's a full holistic review. We literally look at everything. We go as far as building you your own personalized financial portal. We'll give you a bird's eye view of your entire financial life, and we'll hone in on every financial issue you need to address today. Whether it's an income plan for retirement, how do you take social security? How do you draw from your portfolio? How do you factor in inflation? We'll build a dynamic income plan for you. We'll look at diversification. Has your portfolio been up and down with the markets, extremely volatile, or have you been sitting in cash? Paralysis by analysis, you can't figure out what to do. We'll put together a full investment game plan, tied to your goals, show you how to grow your wealth, but most importantly, protect it over the rest of your life and we'll look at fees and taxes. Wall Street loves to sell you high cost, tax inefficient products, whether it's an annuity, mutual fund, brokerage product, we'll do a deep dive of every investment you own. We'll show you how to reduce the cost, optimize your portfolio for taxes. It's not what you make, it's what you take. You'll get our full tax playbook. If you want this full holistic review and you saved over a million dollars, simply go to www.paincm.com slash financial plan or click the link below to see if you qualify for a free financial review. All right, it's the tipping point. This is where we pinpoint the pain point. Of course, that's P-A-Y-N-E. Having the biggest impact on your wealth right now. And guys, there's a rule called 100 minus your age. And basically what it says is that the percentage of your portfolio that you should have in stocks or equities is 100 minus your age. So if your age, let's say 60 right now, well, then you should have 40% of your money in the stock market, the rest in things like fixed income, bonds, safe investments. So I'm wondering, and with all the financial planning do we do, is this applicable rule? Can we use this when we're building our financial plan? Wait, hang on a second. So if if it's it's 100 minus your age, right, does that mean you're only 50% in the stock market at this point? Whoa, whoa, whoa. Don't rush me here, Chris. Don't rush me. Come on. Yeah, Ali was saying the other day, Chris, we should just round up our ages and he says, hey, my big brother's 50. Well, I like yep. to round down on my age. I don't like to round up my age. But, but you know, it just goes to show you that these rule of thumbs aren't set in stone. You know, they're so subjective. And, you know, I, I you know, would find it hard to believe that Ryan would be, you know, 50% equities or even 60%, you know, considering right now that you're, you know, really in your peak earning years. And that's why, you know, it's so important to sit down and do these financial plans to find out really how close you are to your goals. Hey, guys, remember last week we talked about those two different cases where we had, you know, the one client was, uh, you know, 100% in equities and the other client, the same age, was almost 100% in cash. So I think when it comes to some baby boomers today, it's the rule of 1,000. You know, you take rule of 1,000 minus your age, <laughs> and some people put it all in equities and some people put it all in cash. It's, uh, it's, it's pretty fascinating to watch. Well, it's a problem, right? Because, you know, the one premise we have with our firm is we look at doing what you call goal-based allocations meaning let's figure out what you're trying to achieve. And then we can go back reverse engineer and decide how much you should have in stocks or at risk, how much should be in safe investments. And it's different for everybody. Like I have a client who's in his fifties, had a big liquidity event. He's very, very risk averse. Well, we don't have more than 40% in the stock market. He doesn't need more risk than that. And if he had more risk than that and the market went down, he would kill me. (laughs) So you know, I think it's it's really important to assess what your own goals are because, and to your point, a lot of people now that are baby boomers probably need more risk than they're taking um, because they're going to live a lot longer. Yeah. And even to that point too, like, I mean, if you think about a lot of clients that I have, you know, they're set for life. What they're thinking about is the next generation, their, their grandkids, their great grandkids. And, you know, the stock market goes up over time. So maybe in that case, it makes sense to take more risk. Well, I think it all comes down to the way I started in the industry, right? I would start with uh, a new client and I guess they hired me on the premise that they were going to make money. And as soon as the market became volatile and turned down, they blow up their portfolio. I go, what are you doing? I'm getting out of these things don't work. Obviously I'm not making any money. It's not a good idea. So, you know, one of the reasons why you can't go with rule-based strategies, you have to go with planning-based strategies because you have to attach that emotional resolve to staying invested because 
I don't care how smart you are about the markets. If you don't stay invested, you're going to lose. No, no, it's a great point. And now you actually have the opposite problem, right? Markets have gone straight up. The animal spirits are out. And the other thing is your life changes. And this is why you want to reevaluate your asset allocation a lot, because as you get close to retirement, if you're retired now and you're more dependent on your portfolio, the less dependent you want to be on risk assets. And with the market going straight up, a lot of us have way too much money in the stock market right now. Now we might be 10 years older. We're more reliant on our portfolio, we're getting closer to it. You've got to reassess your asset allocation and do it while the getting's good, by the way, because when the market goes down, it's too late. What do you mean down? The market never goes down, Ryan. What's wrong with you? <laughs> you know, it goes sideways and then it goes higher, just like the real estate market did 20 years ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You wish, buddy. You wish. Oh, no, markets are extremely volatile. Um, and we forget about that. We're in a big booming bull market. And secondly, no one's going to tell you when the party's over. That's why you have to be so proactive. And right now it's the best time to look at it. You know, look at where your goals are. Maybe you're ahead now because the market's up. You can actually get more conservative. But I feel like a lot of people right now uh, are not doing that. They're not being smart about their asset allocation. Well, you know what? On that same note, Rise, as a matter of fact, I met with some of our clients, long-term clients uh, recently, and we were looking at their portfolio and they're a little bit aggressive on their equity allocation. I said, you know, now's really probably a good time for us to rebalance and take some profit. And they said, why? We're making so much money. I said, yeah, you are until you're not. What's the old adage, uh, be greedy when others are fearful and fearful when others are greedy. And you can probably apply some of that being fearful right now, given how hot the market's been. But I think one thing that's been discounted by almost everybody is that how much longer you're living. Um, at dinner with a good buddy last night, and we have a lot of friends down in Florida who are been retired now for over 15, 20 years. And they're getting close to running out of money. They didn't plan properly. Um, and you know we know it because it, if the market's up, then they join us for dinner. But if the market's down, they say, well, we're, we're, gonna, we're not going to go out this weekend. So, you know, you don't want to get to that point in your life where you're worried about whether you can afford dinner. So I think the key is, you know, plan to live longer than you ever possibly expected. Yeah, you throw the kitchen sink at your financial plan. But the other side of that uh, coin is how many of us are just sitting with way too much money in money market funds and safe investments and probably need a little more risk? Because your point about longevity what we're finding is a lot of baby boomers specifically have so much money in money market funds because it paid that 5%. But again, when you look at taxation, you look at inflation and the fact the Fed's going to cut interest rates, that's not going to solve the growth problem you need in retirement. And it's a tough rule of thumb, but your costs are going to double over your retirement just because of inflation. So you have to grow your money. So being too conservative is not the answer either. No, it's also making sure that the investments that you have are secure, right? You have some of these non-traded REITs, you have some of these investments where you're lending to people for high risk. You know, they borrow from you at 10 or 12%. I mean, that's the biggest red flag you could possibly see. And, you know, it, it's, it's not a problem until it's a problem. Yeah, it's great getting that 12%, but, you know, there's also the risk that you don't get your money back. And uh, I think that causes a much greater issue. Yeah, and that's, that's, that's a good point too, right? The closer you get to being dependent on your money, the more liquid or easier access you want to have to that money and some of these products out there that they sell on Wall Street, like buyer beware, uh, you know, it's the most. And that's why I don't like annuities, because what ends up happening most of the time is you get your money locked up when they start paying you income and then you give up your principal forever. What's more dangerous than giving up your principal in retirement? And so many people lock their money into these annuities, which aren't inflation adjusted, by the way. Um, and then the insurance company slowly doles your money back to you over time. That's not a great deal, in my opinion. Well, that's why I think that uh, insurance companies are so evil and devious, right? I mean, they <clears throat> we're going to pay you 9%. <clears throat> well, you know, most of it's your own money coming back. Yeah, but you don't understand, Bobby. It's 9%. I'm like, it's not 9%. <laughs> you <know? laughs> well, you know, I, I, I got a comment on something Ryan said. It is a great deal. It's just a great deal for the insurance company, not for the annuitant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The other thing, too, is you got to think about how, what, how your accounts are titled. Um, I recently met with a prospect that had $5 million, and all of it was in IRAs. And I showed him his projection. It didn't really look that great. He's like, how can I look that great? I got $5 million. I said, well, in reality... You only have about two and a half million because the other two and a half is being taxed and it's going to the government. Yeah. So you might need a bigger growth rate of your money just to overcome whatever taxes you have to pay, especially on those retirement accounts. So it's just not as simple as a one size fits all approach. I would recommend you don't use the rule of 100 when building your financial plan. Dangerous way to do it. Goal-based planning. It's only worked for the 50 plus years we've used it. 
you know, make sure you're reevaluating your allocation today. Don't wait on it. You know, I couldn't agree more. As I, as I watched Ryan and Chris grow up, I found out that rules were made to be broken and nothing breaks rules on. And, and when it comes to investing than in Wall Street. All right, it's the hidden facts of finance, random financial facts that may surprise you or even shock you. All right, Bob, U.S. mergers and acquisitions rose 37% this year for the first nine months compared to the same time last year. Global M&A transaction values so far this year have been roughly about $2 trillion, are already beating all of 2023's $1.6 trillion. And the IPO market has improved, according to KPMG, Public offerings listed in the U.S. raised $28.3 billion so far this year. That's up over 50% since last year. Sounds like the animal spirits are back. Sounds like the animal spirits are back. And it sounds like what I used to really despise back in the 80s and 90s, when they had big years in M&As, all the investment bankers would get these gigantic bonuses at Christmas time. <laughs> and my clients would call up and go, well, Bob, how big was your bonus? And I said, no, no, that's the other side of the house. We don't get bonuses. And it's like, oh, wow, yeah, we really felt bad. These guys are getting all that money. And I feel like I'm paying it. And I said, well, hey. I guess you are. <laughs> Bob, you had to eat what you killed. You know, that was, uh, that was, the, real, that was the real error on Wall Street. That's just that's true. The real men did on Wall Street. Yeah, I wonder if those uh, special purpose acquisition companies, those SPACs will come back again. <laughs> Oh, you know they will, Chris. You know, when, I, when anybody raises money on that side of the business, they never want to give it back. They'll find something to invest in. Trust me. I think when Ryan starts talking about we should get more creative with our products, you and I should run for the hills. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> All right, Chris. The S&P 500 stock price index is driven by earnings per share, which have been growing mostly between 6 and 7% a year since the 1950s. The earnings per share could double to $400 uh, earnings per share by the end of the decade, putting the S and P 500 at 8,000. If you base it on today's valuation, so there you go. The S and P is going to 8,000. Might as well just stay invested and go away for a couple of years. Yeah, well, you know, it's like Benjamin Graham said: in in the short run, the stock market's a voting machine; in the long run, it's a weighing machine. If you just go away, ignore all the noise, like Rip Van Winkle, and just wake up like a decade later, you'll be very happy with your portfolio values without making any decisions on it. That's it's not a bad way to do it. Then we'd find out if dad actually can grow a beard. <laughs> <laughs> I, actually, I don't think he can. Let's not go there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Bob. EVs as a percentage of new car sales are up and sales of electrified vehicles, be they hybrid or fully electric, now account for 19% of all total U.S. sales. That's up three percentage points from the same period a year ago. Also, the average price of a new car in the USA was $45,000 in September. That's down 3% from last year, but still up 29% from 2019 before the pandemic. You know, guys, I don't care if it's an electric vehicle, a hybrid vehicle, or a gas vehicle. Greatest marketing job in the history of the planet was the auto companies convincing us that we needed to own a car that costs as much as the first house we ever bought. Just had a friend of mine last week buy a brand new Range Rover off the showroom floor, it was $180,000 for a car. Give me a break. I want to party with Bob's friends, Chris. Range Rovers for all. Hey, hope you enjoyed episode 178, Pain Points of Wealth. If you like our podcast, love our podcast, please give us a five-star rating on iTunes. Or if this is on Spotify, you can subscribe, give the five-star rating. If you're watching this on YouTube, you can like this episode. You can subscribe to our channel. Click that notification bell to be updated. Every week of all our new content, your support gives us the support to continue to do this podcast. That's it for this week. Stay loose and keep an open mind. Thanks for listening to The Pain Points of Wealth. Hopefully you found the ideas discussed in this episode valuable and useful for your own financial journey. You can find out more about Bob, Ryan, and Chris's firm, Payne Capital Management, at BeBullish.com or through the contact information found in the description of this episode in your podcast player or app. Join us next week for another episode of The Pain Points of Wealth, brought to you by Payne Capital Management. Information provided on today's show is provided for informational purposes only and does not constitute investment, tax, or legal advice. Investment is obtained from sources that are deemed to be reliable, but their accuracy and completeness cannot be guaranteed. 